Welcome to Kittle's first major lesson on color theory in graphic design. And in this video, we're going to be talking about four key factors of color. We're going to talk about the history of color, color classification, along with how light impacts color perception, color models, and then lastly, color psychology. So there is quite a bit to get into here. So go ahead and feel free to grab a cup of coffee or tea, whatever you want to take notes with, and we will get rolling. Now, the goal with this first lesson is for you to begin your mastery of color theory concepts because we want you to take the guesswork and trial and error out of your process when it comes to picking colors. So here are three key takeaways you can expect to learn from this lesson. First, you'll learn to use color thoughtfully and consistently, making your designs stand out and resonate with audiences. Number two, you'll understand the core principles of color relationships, the HSV model and color mixing methods to create cohesive designs for both digital and print media. And thirdly, you'll discover how color influences perception and mood, allowing you to design with more intentionality. And by the way, if at any point you're more of a reader, we have this exact lesson that you're watching and all of the subsequent lessons on color theory available on our blog. And I have linked all of those down in the description. If there's one particular part of the theory that is more attractive to you, you can check that out. But let's go ahead and start with defining what color theory theory is. Color theory is the set of principles on color that we use to universally understand how colors work together to impact our emotions, our perceptions, and even our decisions. Color theory typically includes the color wheel, which you've probably seen at some point. It includes color harmony, the psychology of color, and what I assume most people struggle with, how to mix color. Color theory equips us with a much deeper understanding of color in design in order to create harmony, contrast, and balance enhancing design cohesiveness and maximizing visual impacts. And by the way, we have another course on the core principles of graphic design, which you can go and check out where we deep dive into those principles like contrast and harmony among many others. At its core though, color theory helps answer questions about color, obviously. So for example, how do colors interact? How do colors make people feel? What makes some color combinations appealing and others feel like jarring and confusing? Color theory is a combination of artistic principles and scientific insights. On the artistic side, color theory helps us select colors that resonate emotionally and achieve harmony, like I was mentioning before. But on the scientific side, color theory informs other disciplines like chemistry, digital imaging, and even astronomy. It's actually kind of crazy to think about how far reaching the impact of color really is. So these two foundational principles, art and science, in color theory stem from the work of two prominent theorists, a scientist and an artist. And together, they laid the groundwork for our modern understanding of color, experimenting with how colors interact scientifically and how they resonate psychologically. So let's talk about some of that color theory history now so you have an even better understanding of what you're learning. Color theory has roots as far back as Aristotle's work, one of the great ancient philosophers, if you don't know who that is. And it was later developed by numerous theorists. But for now, we're going to talk about two of the most revolutionary color theorists who laid the groundwork, like I mentioned earlier, and they developed the color theory we know today. Remember, one scientist, one artist. In the 17th century, Isaac Newton, our first important person, figured out that white light is a combination of colors that can be separated by a prism, revealing the spectrum red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This discovery led to Newton's development of the color wheel and the idea that colors could be mixed from a set of primary colors, which are red, green, and blue. Now, fast forward two centuries later, and there are two other scientists, Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz, defined red, green, and blue as primary colors that combine to produce white light, which ultimately led to the RGB color model we use in digital screens today. All right, another two centuries later, our second important person, Johann Wolfgang von Goth, brought color theory beyond wavelengths of light and into the realm of human perception. And this is just a fancy way of saying how we interpret light and color as humans. Now, while Newton saw color as a scientific phenomenon, Goth believed color was a shifting phenomenon that could change based on context, perspective, and even mood. He noted how some colors appeared warm, right? Like reds and yellows. Others seemed 
cool like blues and greens and he also talked about how color affects mood a perspective that is now key in fields like interior design marketing and color therapy goth experimented with prisms like newton did as well as with black and white patterns different shades of gray different colored backgrounds and he was always observing how colors appear differently depending on their surroundings so now let's talk about mixing colors with two primary methods called additive and subtractive mixing. Newton's experiments with white light revealed that colors behave differently depending on the medium. Remember those two scientists we mentioned earlier, Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz? Well, where these two showed that red, green, and blue combined to create white light, they were actually creating the groundwork for both the RGB model and the concepts of additive and subtractive mixing, which we're talking about right now. So additive mixing is a process where primary colors are combined in varying intensities to create different colors. The more colors you add, the lighter the outcome becomes. When all primary colors are combined at full intensity, they just produce white light. Now, it's important so that we don't get confused here that this additive color mixing technique is unique to light-based systems like the RGB model. The RGB model of additive color mixing is used for digital displays, like probably what you're using right now, a computer or a smartphone. Subtractive mixing is a process in which colors combine to produce different colors at darker intensities. The CMYK method, used in physical media such as print, uses the primary colors sign cyan, magenta, and yellow. These pigments absorb specific wavelengths of light, and when all three are combined, they produce black, which is that K letter. You may already know this, but the CMYK method is used in physical media. I just mentioned that, like print, but also physical mediums, like painting. While RGB and CMYK are the two most common color models, you may also be familiar with the traditional color model, which is RYB, used for things like painting. Even if you don't call it that, you're probably familiar with colors for painting, and RYB is another method that uses subtractive mixing of the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, to create your other more nuanced colors. Now, where does the K come from again, that letter K in CMYK? Well, that's just the standardized letter for black. When all of the colors are mixed together, it produces a neutral, dark, muddy color, which in printing, it's pretty much just black. There's more technical kind of back-end mixology to that, but for now, we're going to keep it pretty basic. Just remember, K means black. Now, why do you need to know the difference between RGB, CMYK, and RYB? Well, understanding the additive and subtractive mixing methods allows you to anticipate how colors are going to appear on different mediums. For instance, a vibrant color on your screen may appear really muted in print. So being aware of these differences ensure that your designs are going to look as you intended them to look across different formats. Now, there are three categories of color we're going to talk about, which are known as primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. I know there's a lot of different lists of three in this, but bear with us. So at the foundation of color theory lies the concept of mixing. All colors are derived from three primary colors that differ across these three models I just mentioned. Primary colors create secondary, and tertiary colors. So let's go ahead and break down each category. Primary colors are the root colors from which all other colors derive. These colors cannot be created by mixing other colors together, and their combination form the basis for more complex hues or base colors we're going to talk about a little later. Secondary colors are created by mixing two primary colors together, for example, red and blue or blue and yellow. A tertiary color is a primary color that's combined with a neighboring secondary color on the color wheel. These colors help create more precise palettes for you, adding depth and complexity. So for RYB, red, yellow, blue, primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. The secondary colors would be purple, green, and orange. And then the tertiary colors are red, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, green, blue, green, blue, purple, and red, purple. For RGB, your primary colors are in the name red, green, and blue. The secondary colors for RGB would be cyan, magenta, and yellow. And the tertiary colors are going to be amber, chartreuse, spring green, azure, violet, and rose. And then for the CMYK method, that's also in the name, your primary colors are going to be cyan, magenta, and yellow. Remember, black is not a primary color. Your secondary colors are going to be red, green, and blue. And your tertiary colors are going to be orange, chartreuse, spring green, azure, violet, and rose. Now, let's get 
even a little bit more detailed. One of the most important models in color theory is HSV, which stands for hue, saturation, and value. These three elements define how we perceive and describe colors, making them essential for any designer who wants to understand the nuances of color. So let's define each one of these. Hue is the base color itself. For example, it's going to be red, blue, green, etc. This is often the first aspect of color we notice, making it foundational in setting an overall tone for your design. A change in hue changes the color entirely, such as shifting red to blue, which will evoke very different emotions and reactions. Saturation refers to the intensity or purity of a color. Highly saturated colors are going to appear bold and vivid while less saturated colors are going to be softer and more subdued. Adjusting saturation allows you to create either something really energetic and eye-catching or perhaps more muted, more calming, something like a backdrop, and it all depends on your design need. Lastly, value describes the lightness or darkness of a color, impacting the overall brightness and contrast. A color with a high value is going to appear lighter, while one with a low value appears darker. Value adjustments can add contrast to help the dimension of your design, and it helps certain elements stand out. Adding white is going to tint your color, making it appear lighter or pastel, and adding black is going to shade your color, affecting the value and making it appear more dull or dark. If you add gray to colors, you are creating a tone of that color, which is a modification of that color's intensity. Now, why does the HSV model matter in design? Using the HSV model enables designers to use colors in a way that feels much more harmonious and visually appealing. A deep understanding of hue, saturation, and value, HSV, allows you to fine-tune your color choices, whether you're going to be aiming for something super high impact with vibrant hues or something much more subtle and much more muted. Now, it's also important to know the influence of light on color perception. Light has a profound effect on how we perceive color, and this can vary significantly based on the environment in which the design or the art is viewed. Bright natural light may make colors look look more vivid, while dim artificial light can make them seem more muted or dull. All right, now the last important component to think about is color psychology. Color speaks to viewers like you and I on an emotional level and it's an integral part of color theory. When used thoughtfully and purposefully, colors can evoke a wide range of emotions like calmness, maybe excitement, trust, maybe even energy. Additionally, color temperature plays a significant role in that psychology of how color can be perceived in images on an emotional and psychological level. Think about this, color temperature refers to either warmth or coolness in color, and it's often categorized into those two groups, warm and cold. Cool colors include blues, greens, and purples, and tend to create a calming, soothing, maybe a relaxing effect. And they're often associated with things like tranquility, nature, maybe peace. Cool colors are typically used to create a more airy or serene looking space or design, and they're a go-to choice for interior design spaces where you need to focus or rest like an office or a bedroom. Warm colors, on the other hand, include reds, oranges, and yellows, and they may be associated more with heat and energy. They're going to evoke excitement, energy, maybe even passion as an emotion, and they're ideal for spaces that need to feel more lively or engaging. All right, so there's a lot more to unpack, but for now, let's briefly wrap up with some key takeaways from this color lesson. By mastering the basics of color theory, you are going to gain the tools to make smart color choices that communicate and leave lasting impression. So here are some of those takeaways. Number one, experimenting with primary, secondary, and tertiary colors will help you build a more versatile color palette that can shift with your design needs. Number two, leveraging the HSV model helps you balance colors. Adjusting hue, saturation, and value allows you to create palettes that are appropriate for different contexts and different moods. Number three, understanding additive and subtractive attractive mixing can help you choose the correct color model to ensure colors are going to appear as expected in both your digital and your print mediums. And four, finally, lighting and color temperature can highly determine your desired outcome. Remember that lighting conditions affect color perception and you need to design accordingly. So that's all for this lesson in color theory, but if you're eager to jump ahead, you're gonna find links to those subsequent articles on our blog while we are making more videos like this one out of each lesson. And if there are questions 
questions you have about color, something you want to dive deeper into, please drop a comment down below so we can check that out. And of course, while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to the Kittle channel here so you don't miss future videos and lessons like this one. Oh, and if you're new to Kittle and you want to give it a try, that's our design tool. You'll find a link down in the description and you can use all sorts of our different design features, including our smart color palette tool, which might actually save you a ton of time. Thanks again so much for watching and we will see you in the next video.